Welcome back. So we talked about how the musical notes are sounds that are periodic with a certain frequency and that any kind of musical note you can actually understand as being a combination of pure tones where the frequency of the lowest one matches the frequency of your note but then you have all of these higher pure tones as well whose frequencies are multiples of that fundamental frequency. Sometimes this is known as the harmonic series. And we talked about last time how it is that stringed instruments are actually able to produce that series of tones. So I was saying that when you have a vibrating stretch string, there are actually just certain specific ways that that can vibrate in simple harmonic motion. These correspond to what we call standing waves on the string. And you see different patterns that are constrained by the fact that the two ends have to be fixed. And so that means that there are only certain wavelengths of these standing waves allowed. And if you work out the frequencies corresponding to those certain wavelengths, then that turns into this series of frequencies that are multiples of the lowest one. In this case, it was 50 hertz. And so then the first, second harmonic would be 100 hertz, then 150, then 200. Okay. So I wanted to do uh, a, a couple of demos today. So the first one, I want to show you just in practice that when I pluck a guitar string, that you actually do get a combination of all these frequencies. And so generally when you pluck the spring, it's some kind of complicated motion, but you can understand that by the principle of superposition as these basic kinds of vibrations just happening on top of one another. And so the way that we can see this is just to record the sound of a plucked guitar string, look at this frequency spectrum of that sound, and then we should see all of these particular frequencies. Okay, so let us, uh, let's start with that. And so I'll pull up Audacity here. And so we are just going to make sure that everything's working and start the recording. Okay, and so there's the, there's the recording. Uh, if we zoom in on that, we should see the periodic time graph that we expect. And so, so there it is. And now instead of looking at that time graph, what I want to do is look at the spectrum of this note. So the way to do that in Audacity is you just select a region and then we do analyze plot spectrum. Okay. And so we should just uh, correct this. So choose a size um, here which is larger, that's just a little bit more resolution on the frequency. And the other thing we wanna do is just change to linear frequency for the, for the x-axis, okay. And then unfortunately this displays the entire uh, possible range of human hearing. So what we can do is just stretch it out manually like this and then we, sh we will see the various frequencies that are present once we zoom in enough on that low frequency range. And so it, what you see is that, in fact, uh, you, you do get this series of frequencies. Um, it says 84 hertz is this lowest peak, and then you've got um, 167, so basically double that and triple and quadruple. So in that note that I plucked, you actually see all of these different higher harmonics um, up, going up for a while. Okay. And so each of those is, is basically a pure tone with a certain sound to it. And so what I wanted to demonstrate next is just like what, what do that, what does that series of pure tones sound like? We'll be able to in a simulation first and then in real life actually listen to the sounds of those individual pure tones. Okay, so let's start with the simulation here. 
So I'll go over to, to this one. Um, oops, that's not what I wanted. Let's yeah, just go back to that one. Here we go. So we've talked about how musical notes played by different instruments are actually combinations of pure tones with different frequencies that are all multiples of a fundamental frequency that we associate with the musical tone. And we also talked about how with stretched strings, we can understand where all of those frequencies are coming from because they correspond to the basic ways that the string can vibrate in simple harmonic motion. And so I was on the internet recently and I found this amazing demonstration of this concept. So this is from Alexander Chen github.io slash harmonics. Thanks, Alexander. And so what it shows is just the various patterns of vibration that a stretched string can have. And if we hover over the various pictures, then we can hear the sound that each of those ways of vibrating uh, would produce. So let's, let's hear them starting with the fundamental. Oops, let's try that. There we go. And there are more above that. They just keep going. And so the amazing thing is that when I pluck a string on, on a guitar, actually all of those tones, uh, at least relative to, the, relative to the fundamental, are present. And our brain just combines it into one sound, which sounds like the fundamental frequency, but with a different timbre than the pure tone that you hear when I just hover over that one. The other amazing thing is that these are these are all sorts of different notes, but they're kind of related in musical ways. And so we can hear standard intervals that come up all the time in music, an octave, fifth, fourth, a third, and then we can go up higher and the intervals get smaller and smaller. So we could just given these natural frequencies that a string wants to vibrate, uh, we can, can we can create music that sounds sounds like the music that we listen to. So it's it quite a lot of fun to play around with that and and hear those those harm those harmonic tones above some fundamental and actually try to create a little bit of music only using those tones. Um, so we're going to talk l much more later about why certain intervals, certain combinations of frequencies are used in like standard music, um, out of all of the infinite number of possible frequencies that exist, um, you, why do we use these certain combinations? And and this demonstration uh, was a little bit, I think it gave us a little bit of insight into that. So the other thing I wanted to show you here is, let me just go back to the big screen here. So the other thing I wanted to show you is uh, trying to make those same tones that we saw in the simulation uh, using an actual stringed instrument. And so I did that a little bit last time, but what I realized is that uh, what we can do this fairly effectively using a bow. 
So it's a little weird to be bowing a guitar, but that's what I have. And so if I if I just play uh, in the middle, then I get the fundamental frequency. But remember, so those those higher harmonics, they correspond to waves that have a node halfway along, and then a third of the way along, and then a quarter of the way along, and a fifth of the way along. And so in order to, to just get that string to vibrate in the way that corresponds to the second, third, fourth harmonic, what I can do is just gently place my finger at the place where there's supposed to be a node and then bow the string and and um, we'll hear we'll hear that harmonic okay so here's the fundamental again second harmonic okay and then the third harmonic fourth seventh and the eighth maybe I skipped one there we go that was the eighth so going down all right so so you could hear basically when I when I set up the vibration on the string in a particular way then we were able to hear just the sound of that one harmonic and, and the other ones were the lower ones uh, were not present there. Yeah. So depending on how I play a string, I end up with a different combination of those possible vibrational modes. Okay, so, so the next thing I want to do is basically just repeat this exercise of understanding the possible frequencies, but with a different kind of an instrument. And so many of our instruments are based on strat strings, but then there are also many instruments based on just tubes filled with air. So pretty much all of your wind instruments are like this. Some of them are more complicated. They have various holes. Some of them are, are not a uniform thickness. But I want to start just by analyzing the simplest situation of a basically just, just a tube like this one. And so this is, just, this is just a rubber tube that I found in my laundry room. And it's, it's got a hole in it. And we're going to later on turn this into a musical instrument. But before we do that, I want to predict what the frequencies that it will produce are going to be. And so just to set it up, I want to think about what is going on inside the tube. If we do something like play this thing like a trumpet, um, you know, what's happening? What, what is the wave doing? And so if you remember, when we talk about waves in air, then it just has to do with displacement of the air molecules. And in this case, like the guitar string, the wave that we're going to set up is a standing wave. So that means that there'll be some place, some places where the displacement is maximum, some places where the displacement is just always zero. Those are the nodes. And in this case, it's just a longitudinal dip displacement of air rather than a transverse displacement of the string. Okay. So specifically, when we have something like a tube and we're putting that one end up to our mouth, or, or if it's closed for some other reason, that means that we can't have a large um, amplitude of displacement at that location. And so we model that by a standing wave with a node at this end. But then at the other end, what you need is an antinode. You want your tube to be producing a lot of sound. And so the air at the other end has to be moving back and forth a lot in order to then uh, create that displacement in the surrounding air 
and produce a sound wave. Okay, so these wind instruments, when, when you play a wind instrument, you are setting up a standing wave inside the tube um, with this constraint that you have a node at one end and an anti-node at the other end. And so then it's an interesting exercise to see if you can predict what the possible frequencies are. So we have the constraint I just mentioned that you have to have a node at one end and an anti-node at the other end. That still leaves you a bunch of possibilities, just like for the stretch string, when we had a node at either end, we had various possible standing waves. And so you can try to make a diagram of these possible standing wave patterns. Then you can try to understand what are the what are the various wavelengths corresponding to your pictures. Okay, so let's say we have a tube that's one meter long. That's actually how, how long my tube is. And so what are the various wavelengths of standing waves that we can have in this tube with a node at one end and an antinode at the other? And then once you have the wavelengths, you could try to predict the frequencies using our standard formula relating wavelength, frequency, and wave speed. Now in this case, the wave is just a wave in air. That's what's inside the tube. And so the wave speed is just th the speed of sound in air, which we'll take to be 340 meters per second. So this is a really good exercise to work through, spend some time on, and see if you can get a prediction. And so I'd recommend you pause the video and give it a shot. And now I'm going to take you through it. Um, so we'll see what prediction that we make for the sounds being produced by this tube. Okay. So, so the first step is just going to be to sketch the allowed shapes for these possible standing waves. And I already drew one of them. So the simplest possibility where you have a node at one end and an anti-node at the other end, and no other nodes or anti-nodes. Okay, and so this would be just the air would be going in and out here um, with the maximum displacement, and in the middle, the air would be going back and forth with a smaller amplitude and smaller and smaller until you got to zero at the end. Okay. Then in the next possibility, you would have some place in the middle that has a node. And so instead of um, this small portion of a wavelength, you get more of a full wavelength. So it goes up and then down to zero and then back down. So it's kind of a standing wave with one node at this end and one node in the middle and then an anti-node here. And then the next possibility has two anti-nodes in the middle, sorry, two nodes in the middle. So a node, a node, a node, and then an anti-node. And then you can imagine what the, what the further ones are going to be. So the next step is to find the wavelengths. And so there's various ways of doing this. Um, one way to think about it is to think about, in each case, how many wavelengths fit into this one meter. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take you through this. Looking at the very first example, so I'll give you two ways to think about it. Okay, so the first way is to say, okay, well, how many wavelengths fit in this one meter? And so in this case, we actually only have a fraction of a whole wavelength. And the fraction is one quarter because this is the part where the wave goes from zero up to the maximum. After another similar distance, it would go down to zero again after another meter, it would go down to the minimum. And then after another meter, it would come back up to zero. So one full wavelength would be four meters. Okay, so the, the one quarter of a wavelength is equal to one meter, or the wavelength is equal to four meters. Uh, what about this one? Well, we could say, in this case, one way to do it is to say that um, what we can see here in this case is three quarters of a wavelength. Okay, so one quarter, two quarters, three quarters of a wavelength. So three quarters of a wavelength is equal to one meter. And then just rearranging that, you get that the wavelength is four thirds of a meter. The other way we could imagine that is just dividing this up into 
thirds and you see um, so one third of a meter, two thirds of a meter, th one meter, and then you'd need another third of a meter there before it would come back up. Um, the last one actually is, is probably the easiest one here um, because you could actually just see what the wavelength is. The wavelength is from here to here and that's a fraction of this in t of this meter. Um, what fraction is it? Well, it's four fifths because if you if you divide um, if you divide this up every time there's a node or an anti node, then those are equal distances. So that would be dividing the whole meter up into one, two, three, four, five parts, and our wave covers four fifths of that meter. Okay, so those are the wavelengths that you get for these first three possibilities. And you probably are, you could probably see a pattern here. So four meters, four meters divided by three, four meters divided by five. So it's like four meters divided by all the odd numbers. But you might want to do one more example just to convince yourself. Okay, and then finally, we're going to go ahead and calculate the frequencies for each of those cases. And so to do this, we just apply the same formula um, as usual relating frequency, wavelength, and wave speed. And we rearrange it by dividing through by the wavelength to get a formula that has just the frequency on the left-hand side. Okay. And so if we work these things out, so I basically just take each wavelength plug it into the formula here. And for the wave speed, we're always using the speed of sound. In this case, because this, the wave is traveling through air and not on a string or in any other medium. Okay, so let's have a look at what we get. So this first frequency is 340 meters divided by, uh, meters per second divided by four meters. That works out to 85 Hertz. And the second frequency you get 340 meters per second divided by 1.33 meters, so that's four thirds of a meter, um, works out to 255 hertz. So you notice it's actually not double the original frequency. It's not, that would, that would be 170 hertz, but this is 255 hertz, which is actually three times that fundamental frequency. And this one, using lambda equals 0 0.8 meters, or four-fifths of a meter, you end up getting 425 hertz, which is five times the fundamental frequency. And so what you find is that this particular musical instrument, just a straight tube, our prediction is that it is going to produce musical tones, um, or it'll produce musical tones whose pure tones are living at these particular frequencies that are like the fundamental and then three times that frequency and then five times that frequency. So in the next video, we'll try to verify that. We'll try to actually turn this thing into a musical instrument and play it and see if actually these are the frequencies that we produce.